Today we're going to discuss a famous author by the name of Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was born in 1818 in Talbot County, Maryland. However, he's not sure of his birth because uh, they didn't keep records for slaves in those times. He did die in 1895. Frederick Douglass had no formal education, but he was a self-taught man. He taught himself to read and write, and by the age of 21, he escaped to Massachusetts and won his freedom. There he met his wife and married, and then later become, became an avid uh, promoter of the abolitionist movement and promoted a newspaper called the North Star. Uh, Frederick Douglass wrote uh, several lectures and speeches. Um, of course, he wrote his autobiography, and we are going to be looking at an excerpt from his autobiography entitled The Battle with Mr. Covey. Um, before we get started with that, however, we'll talk a little bit about his um, idea of the self-made man. Um, in his lectures, he talks about how if a man works hard, it doesn't matter what station in life he comes from, that he can rise to prominence with his uh, hard work. And so, so today we're going to look at this piece by... Douglas called The Battle with Mr. Covey, and I'm just going to read a little excerpt. Uh, it says here, I have already intimated that my condition was much worse during the first six months of, months of my stay with Mr. Covey than in the last six months. The circumstances leading to the change in Mr. Covey's course toward me form an epoch in my humble history. You have seen how a man was made a slave, and you shall see how a slave was made a man. On one of the hottest days of the month of August in 1833, Bill Smith, William Hughes, a slave named Eli, and myself were engaged in fanning wheat. Hughes was clearing the fanned wheat from before the fan, and Eli was turning. Smith was feeding, and I was carrying wheat to the fan, and the work was simple, requiring strength rather than intellect. Yet to one entirely unused to such work, it came very hard. And about three o'clock of that day, I broke down with my strength my strength failed me, and I was seized with a violent aching of, of my head. Attending with extreme dizziness, I trembled in every limb, and finding what was coming, I nerved myself up, and feeling it would never do to stop work, I stood as long as I could, staggered to the hopper from grain, and when I could stand no longer, I fell and felt as if held down by an immense weight. And the fan, of course, stopped, and everyone had his own work to do, and no one could do the work of the other and have his own. Mr. On. Covey was at the house about a hundred yards from the treading yard where we were fanning, and on hearing the fan stop, he left immediately and came to the spot, Absolutely. looking at me a while, asked me what was the matter, and I told him as well as I could, for I scarce had strength to speak. And he then gave me a savage kick to the side and told me to get up, and I tried to do so, but fell back in the attempt. And he gave me another kick and again told me to rise. And I again tried and succeeded in gaining my feet, but stooping to get the tub with which I was feeding the fan, I again staggered and fell. While down in this situation, Mr. Covey took up the hickory, hickory slat which, which, with which Hughes had been striking off the half bushel marrow measure, and with, his, with this he gave, it, gave me the heavy blow upon the head, making a large wound, and the blood ran freely, and with this again told okay, me... Okay, so basically in the story, um, after Frederick Douglass is beaten by Mr. Covey, he's bleeding profusely, and he decides to run away, and he runs several miles to his actual owner, who is Master Thomas. So anyway, uh, Douglass ran away to Master Thomas's, hoping to find asylum there, and to wage his complaint about the cruelty of Mr. Covey. However, Master Thomas sided with uh, Mr. Covey and told Douglas to go back home. Douglas didn't want to do that, so he ended up uh, running to this um, slave's home by the name of Sandy Jenkins. Sandy Jenkins uh, was superstitious. You could tell he was quite uneducated and uh, believed in uh, magical incantations and things like that. So he gave um, Douglas a root and told him to put it in his pocket and that if he kept it in his pocket that he would be safe from Mr. Covey from beating him further. And so, of course, Douglas didn't really take a whole lot of stock in the root. However, he ended up keeping it in his pocket. And we, when he went back to the farm, uh, Mr. Covey was there. And ironically, uh, Mr. Covey did not uh, beat him at that time. And so, of course at first attributed to the root, but then he noticed that Mr. Covey was in his carriage in his nice Sunday clothing, and he and his family were traveling to Sunday morning services. So he had to put on his best Christian face um, in front of everyone and not beat his slaves. So, of course, when he got back home from church, he walked straight out to the barn and uh, grabbed his whip, and he was ready to um, continue the beating of Frederick Douglass.
Force. So at that, and so I'll read the last little section there of the actual fight between Mr. Uh, Covey and Frederick Douglass. This is on page 429 in your text. It says, This kick had the effect of not only weakening Hughes, but Covey also. And when he saw Hughes bending over with pain, his courage quailed, and he asked me if I meant to persist in my resistance, and I told him I did, come what might, that he had used me like a brute for six months, and that I was determined to be used no longer. And with that, he strove to drag me to a stick that was lying just out of the stable door, and he meant to knock me down. But just as he was leaning over to get the stick, I seized him with both hands by his collar, and I brought him by a sudden snatch to the ground. And by this time, Bill came, and Covey called upon him for assistance. Bill wanted to know what he could do, and, and Covey said, Take hold of him, take hold of him. And Bill said his master hired him out to work and not to help whip me. So we left Covey and myself to fight our own battle, and we were at it for nearly two hours. Covey at length let me go, puffing and blowing at a great rate, saying that if I had not resisted, he would not have whipped me half so much. The truth was that he had not whipped me at all. I considered him as getting entirely the worst end of the bargain for. This battle with Mr. Covey was the turning point in my career as a slave. It rekindled the few expiring embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood. It recalled the departed self-confidence and inspired again with the determination to be free. The gratification afforded by the triumph was the full compensation for whatever else might follow, even death itself. He only can understand the deep satisfaction which I experienced, who has himself repelled by force the bloody arm of slavery. I felt as I never felt before. It was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom. My long crushed spirit rose, cowardice departed, bold defiance took its place, and I now resolved that, however long I might remain a slave in form, the day had passed forward forever when I could be a slave in fact. So what can we say about this excerpt from Frederick Douglass's autobiography? Well, I believe that this is a very important section of his autobiography because this is the turning point of his life. As he said, this is the place where we see the slave become a man. And so Frederick Douglass's voice became the voice of a lion. He, at that point, was not released physically from slavery, but he was released uh, on the inside from the bondage of slavery. He came into his manhood. And so he no longer believed that you always should uh, remain silent and passive and turn the other cheek, but he did believe that there were times when you had to stand up for yourself and say that this is wrong, that they've had enough. And so, of course, he did this, and when he finally was able to achieve his freedom when he escaped to Massachusetts when he was 21, he was able to write about these things and then, of course, inspire other people to do the same thing. And so Frederick Douglass was uh, a voice that um, was heard around the nation and that um, inspired others to uh, take the same approach that he had taken. And so we pay tribute to Frederick Douglass's legacy today and uh, his um, message of freedom.